I'm Steve for This Look With Cars, and here is the 1962 Austin Healey Sprite Mark II. When you first saw this car, it had been sitting for a very long time. Now, look at it. It runs, it drives, it looks great. This is probably the last video that I'll be doing on this car, so I wanted to put a compilation video together of all of the videos stuck into one single video. And stick around until the end. I'll probably have some new footage at the very end of this video. I'm Steve for This Week With Cars, and today I have a Mark II Austin Healey Sprite. That means this is the version after the original Frog Eye or Bug Eyed Sprite. And because a lot of people complain when I call a Sprite a Bug Eye, the way I differentiate it, I will call it a Frog Eye if it's right hand drive and a Bug Eye if it's a left hand drive car. This Mark II Sprite hasn't been on the road in 40 years. And even though this is not a full basket case, it does come with a basket case full of parts. So let's take a look. This is a pretty nice looking car. I have seen the hubcaps around here somewhere. Inside the car, you can see that for some reason, the passenger seat has been unbolted and is actually missing all of its upholstery. There is no carpet in the car. There is a basket full of random stuff. The good news is it looks like there's still a set of keys in it. The bad news is the cable to release the bonnet is broken, so I actually haven't seen under the bonnet yet. So the first task is to try to get that open so we can see what we're dealing with. Down in the driver's foot well is the release for the bonnet. That's this cable right here, and no matter how hard I pull on this cable, it will not budge. I could probably pull it hard enough to break the knob off, but that probably wouldn't do any good. Let's see if we can find another way in. Looking into the grill in the center of the screen, you can see a cable. And that cable attaches to that post right there. And that's what needs to be moved over to release the bonnet. So I think I might be able to stick something really long in through the grill and move that over and pop the bonnet open. Okay, I've got a hook and a screwdriver. Let's see if I can get this open with either one of these. I think that did it. Yep. All right, let's see what we've got here. I was told this car hasn't been on the road in 40 years, and I think I believe it, but it looks like someone's been in here and at least been trying to get it to run. You can see there's a new hose there running to the heater core. There's new clamps and a few parts on this hose that goes to the blower motor. Obviously the high tension leads and the throttle cable are not original. Back in the back there, you see the typical corrosion made by the battery going through the firewall there. Somebody has done something really weird here. They have taken the wire that needs to go to the positive side and kind of just jammed it into the cable there. That's a bit, I've never seen that before. And actually look at this, the original battery cable is still here. So they put a new battery cable on it, but they left the original one. The original battery cable is held on by a clamp right there, so that must be why they left it in place. They were too lazy to get to that clamp and remove it. And obviously we need to remove one of these cables. We don't need both of them. It does look like everything is here. Obviously we'll have to go through the brakes. We'll have to go through the carburetor. We'll have to see if the engine is locked up. And let's hope that the radiator is still in good shape. Let's see if we can tell if someone left any water in it. But at least we can't see any antifreeze up here. So let's hope that that was drained. The engine does still have oil in it. Everything in here besides these things that have been updated is just covered with stuff. So I do believe this has been sitting around for a very long time. Here's one neat piece here. This is some yellow tape that was wound around the original wire harnesses and you'll see this in different places they seem to end up in slightly different places on different cars but if you have a mark one midget and, or a mark two sprite uh, you can use this one as maybe an indication of where you might want to put yours if you're trying to do a concord restoration i don't know how i just noticed it but the battery is in some sort of plastic bag they must have gone to the store and never actually took the battery out of the bag but it, it, it's been left hooked up to the car this whole time. 
I think I'll get the battery out. Let's see if there's a date on it. Okay, I've got the battery out. It does say that it comes with a 50 month warranty, but I'm pretty sure that that has been up. Unfortunately, there is no date marked on it. On the side of it here, it does say remove bag before installation. They did put another ground wire on it and maybe they were having trouble because they did have some of this plastic jammed up into the cable. So maybe they were having connection issues with it. This is certainly something that I've never seen done before. Okay, I have my jump pack hooked up so that we have power to the car now. I'll verify that by testing the power at the starter solenoid. So you can see we have 13 volts there. And this car is positive ground, so I've hooked the positive lead on my multimeter to the engine, and I'm using my negative lead to probe around to see if I have power. I'm now going to turn the key to the ignition position, and we'll see if we get power at the coil. Okay, you can hear the fuel pump is actually running, so I'm gonna have to watch over there and make sure that the carbs aren't leaking. Real quick while it's doing that, I'll see if we have power at the coil which we do. So if the distributor's working, you can see that the float valve is stuck on that carb now and it's leaking all over the place. For now, I'm going to let the carb sit with the fuel filled up in there. You'll be surprised at how many things can be fixed if you just drive your car once in a while or even fill the carburetors with fuel. The gaskets start to swell back up again. It's good to let the valve sit there and fuel. We'll just let that sit there and we'll check back and see if it works any better once it's been exposed to fuel for a while. In the meantime, I'm going to pull the spark plugs out and we'll see if the engine will turn over. I do want to mark these spark plug wires before I pull them off so that I can make sure that I put them back the way that they had them before. I'm going to take just a quick look inside there, see what it looks like. The pistons and the bores actually look perfect still. I'll try to show you that on my tiny boroscope. This is just a camera with a light on it. And I can stick it down inside of the cylinder. That is the top of the piston. And there you can see the sides of the cylinders look like they are in great shape still. Looks like this engine might have been running a little rich from these deposits that are here on the top of the piston. I don't think that's anything to really worry about. The sides of the piston look in very good shape. I don't see any corrosion in here. I'm going to take my oil can, give the engine a slight amount of oil before I crank it over. Okay, let's pull the starter solenoid and see if the engine turns. Turns over quite nicely. So I think if we have spark, this engine will definitely run. I've pulled the distributor cap off. It actually looks very clean and nice inside there. So I'm gonna leave that in place. The rotor looked very nice as well. So I'm not going to replace that. But I can see that there is corrosion down there on the points. So I am going to install a new set of points in the distributor. Then we can see if the engine will fire up take the points out, I want to move it so that the distributor lobe is pushing the points out. So I have the car in fourth gear. I'm just going to bump it until the cam lobe has opened the points all the way. You can see the points are open now. So I'm going to disconnect the condenser, take the points out, and put the new points in. I don't know if you can tell the difference, but the new points are now installed. I did gap these to 0.015, so I can put the rotor, cap, spark plugs, and spark plug wires back on now. Real quick, I want to sort out some of this battery wiring. We have this extra ground strap that they put on. Runs from the ground down to the engine, onto one of the starter bolts. I'm gonna put the car up in the air and see if the ground strap that's supposed to connect the car to the engine is there or not. And if it's not, I'll add one. If it's there, I can probably take this strap off. I'm here underneath the car. Here is the original ground strap, connects to the chassis, and also to the slave cylinder, which is connected to the transmission. 
This is pretty dirty. It's uh, obviously covered in oil and grease, which has been leaking from this car for a very long time. But this should still work. So I don't think we need that other ground strap. I think they might have been trying to solve some other problem. So I'm going to take that off. I have that ground wire removed. Let's check real quick. Make sure the starter still runs. Runs fine. I could try to start the car now, but I want to attend to the fuel leak. So I'm going to take these air cleaners off, get them out of the way, and then I'll show you what I'm going to do to try to tend to this fuel leak. When dealing with these carburetors, your number one tool is a hammer. If you are on the roadside and they start acting up, it only takes a second to use your hammer. So why not try and see if it works? If it doesn't work, then you can move on to something that's going to take more effort. This carburetor right here is the one that is leaking. It's overflowing, the valve is stuck. So what I'm going to do is turn the fuel pump back on. We'll see it leaking. I'll give it a couple taps with the hammer. We'll see if the valve loosens up and see if the fuel stops. You can see the carb is leaking. Give it a couple taps. The fuel leak has stopped. Let's check the pistons. Pistons do move. So you can see that the choke on this carb is engaged more than this one over here, but they are frozen up and I can't move them. Should still run though. So let's turn the ignition on, give it a crank and see what happens. All right, for the first time, let's see if it's gonna start. see if we can adjust the carburetors a little bit and see if we can try this again. It was a little smoky coming out of the tailpipe. That would be due to the little bit of oil that I put in there. The throttle looks okay. The throttle was not stuck. Let's see if we can tap the jet back up. There we go. Okay, second try. See if our oil pressure builds up. Well, the car runs pretty good now. I did not see the oil pressure go up on the gauge. Sometimes the oil pump just needs primed. There could be a problem with the oil gauge altogether, or there could be a massive leak up there and it's just not getting to the gauge. So I need to go take a look and see what's going on there. Right there is where the oil pressure gauge gets its feed from the block. I don't see any problems with it. There is this rubber hose right here this could be cavitated inside, so it may not be passing the pressure along the hose. This is a pretty simple fix, so I'm just gonna throw one of these on real quick. I've cut that oil hose in half, and I don't see any evidence of any oil having come up here. So I don't think that the oil pump was pumping. Here's what the two ends of the pipe look like without the hose on it. I do have a length of the correct hose, so I'll put this on. Put the hose clamps back on. A problem these cars can develop if they've sat for a very long time is that all the oil can drain out of the oil pump. The oil pump dries up and it isn't able to draw oil in when you crank the engine anymore. So to prime the oil pump, you take this bolt out of this banjo fitting that runs down to the oil filter and you just squirt some oil down into that hole. That should fill the oil pump up and then the oil pump should start pumping oil and building up oil pressure. Okay, here's the bolt that goes through that banjo fitting there. There is a crush washer that would go on the other side, so make sure that you find that if it fell down like it did right there, and uh, reinstall that when you're ready. I've got a funnel jammed into that port now, and I'm just going to pour some oil down it. I need to fish my Crush washer back out of there. It was sitting on top of the starter. And now I can reassemble it. 
with the oil pump primed. Let's give this a go again. And there you go, we have oil pressure now. I'll let it pump oil. Make sure that it gets up all the galleys, gets to the top of the engine, lubricates the valves. We definitely have an engine that we can work with here. Real quick, let's see what happens. The brakes, yep, brake pedal stuck down now. Clutch, same thing. Well, that's all that I have time for today. The brakes still need to be done, the clutch needs to be done. We need to put water in here, see if anything's leaking. I am going to take this car much further than I have the barn fine sprites. We'll take this car and turn it into a real driver quality car. And I'm going to bring you along for the whole adventure. So if you want to see more videos like this, comment below and click subscribe. Welcome back to This Week with Cars. Last video with this 1962 Austin Healey Sprite. I got the engine to run and when I hit the clutch and brake pedals, they both stuck to the floor. Today I want to start with trying to get the clutch and the brakes to work. That way the car can move about on its own power. I've shown this several times before for removing the master cylinder, which is the only master cylinder in the car. This one drives both the clutch and the brakes. It's easier to remove this entire pedal box and get to it to replace it that way. You just need to undo the two fittings in the back and then the bolts that hold the pedal box to the firewall. This pedal box is a little harder to get to than it is in the Mark I spray. It's pretty easy to get these master cylinders out. It's just two bolts that hold that in. I've got the new master cylinder here. If I hold that up right there, you can see the bolts just go through the master cylinder and hold it into the pedal box. I'll just clean up the pedal box and put the new master cylinder back in. It's a pretty quick process if you've removed the pedal box from the car. It's a little harder with it in the car because you have to be in the footwell to undo this bolt. And of course this one is in the engine bay and you have your hydraulic lines and other things in the way. It's just pretty quick to pull this off and a lot easier to do it on the bench. I'm gonna make sure to put my springs back in. And there you go, the new master cylinder is installed. I have everything reinstalled. So that's the last of this up here. Besides filling the reservoir with fluid, which I am not going to do until I fix the rest of the clutch and the brakes, all of the rest of the work is underneath the car. Just like the earlier Mark I Sprites, these cars use a solid line that comes down to the clutch slave cylinders. They don't have a hose down here. And you can't see it from here, but there is a bleeder on the slave cylinder as well. Here's the new one. It mounts just like that. You can see there's a bleeder on the top and on the back is a port where the line from the master cylinder comes down to the slave cylinder. I'm gonna take this one off real quick and replace it with a new one. Okay, I've got the new slave cylinder installed. I cleaned everything up before I put it back on. I can't test this yet because it shares the same reservoir as the braking system and I want to at least put the new brake hoses on before I put any fluid in the system. This car has three brake hoses on it, this one here in the back, and then two in the front. I've shown this several times before. I like to just cut the brake hoses. That way you can get a deep socket on this, get it spun off real easily. I'm going to replace all the brake hoses this time with stainless steel ones. I think these are Cobalt brand. The package isn't really labeled. One thing I like about these hoses is the ends are just the same as what the original hoses would be. They do not come with new fasteners, so you'll have to use your uh, nuts and washers off of the original hoses that you had. But otherwise, these install exactly the same as the originals did, but in a better quality stainless steel. 
Remember, only one side on the car turns. This side will turn. This side is fixed, so you must install the hose on the fixed side first. And don't forget the crush washer on this side. By the way, this is kind of a nice piece of kit. This is a wrench that has a ratcheting end on this side, but the open end is also ratcheting, and you saw that I was able to turn that without actually taking it back off of the nut. I don't know if other companies bake a wrench like this, but this is handy in some situations. You install the front two hoses in a similar manner to this one here, so I'm gonna quickly do that. Now that all the brake hoses are installed, I'm going to fill the system with brake fluid. I'm going to bleed everything, see what works and what doesn't work before I go any further. I do plan on working on the brakes some more, but it would be nice to see if everything on the car works and what else is broken. I'm going to bleed the clutch first, and down here in the right side foot well is a little plug that you can remove that will get you good access to the bleeder on the slave cylinder. Okay, I have the clutch and the brakes bled. One way to find out if they work is to try them. So let's start up the engine, see if the clutch works. Okay, the clutch works. Let's see if reverse is there. Okay, feels like all the gears are there. Let's go forward. And I think that some of the brakes stuck when I pushed it down. So I will have to go through and replace all the brakes at the wheels. Let's see how good it works outside. Well, that's it for today. As you can see, it's dark outside now. So what did we learn? We learned that the engine runs, the clutch works, the brakes don't work so well, and some of the lights don't work. These Mark II Sprites and the Mark I Midgets had drum brakes in the front, just like the Mark I Sprite did. So since this car does not have any calipers and only uses wheel cylinders, it's not a surprise that they've gone bad and need replaced. If you want to see more videos like this, comment below and click subscribe. I'm Steve from This Hook With Cars, and last time you saw this Mark II Austin Healey Sprite, I had replaced the master cylinder and the brake hoses. After bleeding the brakes, they work, but not very well. So today I'm going to replace all of the wheel cylinders. This car has drum brakes in the front, and you see six boxes over here. That is because there's two wheel cylinders on each side in the front, as well as the two wheel cylinders in the back. If you had a Mark III Austin Healey Sprite, or a Mark II MG Midget, you would have disc brakes in the front, which would mean you'd have a caliper on each side, and the only wheel cylinders you would need to replace are the two in the back. Today I have the car on my two post lift, that way I can remove all of the wheels at once. It will make the brake job a lot quicker.
Taking the brake drums off should be an easy task. Just take a large Phillips screwdriver and undo the two Phillips screws that hold the drum on. Just take these out completely. Now one piece of advice that I can give you when you're trying to resurrect a car that's been sitting for a long time, don't go pressing the brake pedal real hard. If you feel that the brakes aren't working real well, you don't want the cylinder to get stuck pressing the shoes against the drum, which will make it really hard to get the drum off. So if you have a feeling that your brakes aren't working, go ahead and just uh, take them apart instead of keep trying to press on them because you're only gonna make it worse for trying to get the drum off later. Let's see how easy this one is. I'm just wiggling it back and forth. It is coming off. This hole allows you to get to the brake adjuster and you can release that if you need to. We might have to on one of these other drums, so I'll show you that. But first I wanna show you how to Wiggle the drum off if you can. Okay, I'm gonna turn this so you can see it a little better. Right here, this is the little adjuster that we could turn through that hole if we needed to. It moves a cammed piece that sits on top of this cylinder. And there's also one over here. We could turn those and that would bring the shoes in further and take some of the pressure off of the drum. Hopefully, if you have your cylinder stuck out, you can adjust these and get enough slack between the shoe and the drum to remove it. But a lot of times, the brake surface here actually becomes rusted to the drum so badly that adjusting this is not gonna do anything because it's actually the shoe that's stuck to the drum. And that's why it's really beneficial to try to get the car running and moving around before you try to take the drum off. That way you can break the rusty adhesion between the shoes and the inner surface of the brake drum. You can fool around with the springs a lot to get the shoes off and when installing them, but I like to just pull them off of one side. Now you can see that the springs are loosened and you can take everything out. Now put the car up in the air and we'll take these wheel cylinders out by undoing them from the back side of the backing plate. This car has two wheel cylinders in the front that need removed. So there's two bolts that hold this wheel cylinder right here in. This pipe runs over to the other wheel cylinder which will have this pipe connected and the hose that the brake fluid comes down from the master cylinder which will also have to be removed. So here's what the front on this side looks like. And here's the back on this side. This is the pipe that runs over to the other side. And here's the new brake hose that we had just installed. And the two bolts that hold the wheel cylinder on this side on. The first step would be to disconnect the pipe that runs between the two, and then take the one with the bleeder out first. Here's the little pipe that runs between the two wheel cylinders. I've got that out. Just take the two bolts off of there and it'll fall out. On this cylinder, we have the brake hose coming down to it. Now this is not the side that can spin without twisting the entire hose up. So what I've done is I've loosened it a little and then I'll wiggle the cylinder out and then I'll just unscrew it from out here. And then when I install the new one, I'll screw it onto the hose out here with this hose sticking through the hole. And then I'll mount it back up and then tighten it the little bit last bit of the way that it needs tightened from there. And then I don't have to take the entire hose off to replace this. So here's what I meant. I have my hose sticking through that hole now. And now I can just unscrew the wheel cylinder from the hose. Now that I have these original wheel cylinders off, I need to put the new ones on. And they are directional, so the ones on the front left have to go on the front left. And then there's a different set that goes on the front right. But on each side on the left, the two wheel cylinders are the same. And then on the right, the two wheel cylinders are the same. Okay, I've got the new cylinders installed. You see them there. When you turn this adjuster, it brings the pivot point up further, which ends up pushing out more on the shoes and pushing them closer to the drum. This takes the slack between the pads on the shoe and the inner surface of the drum out. It's important with drum brakes because they retract because of the springs that the slack is adjusted correctly. Otherwise, you have to push your pedal down too far before they engage 
or they rub and create a lot of heat. And of course, you can adjust the adjuster so that it takes all the slack off to make it easier to get the drum off. I'm going to set the adjusters to their lowest point while installing the shoes, and it should go together without any tools. Now with everything setting on there, I'm gonna put the drum on. And I turn it a couple times and that will get the shoes centered in there. Now I'll put the Phillips screws back in and then I'll turn the hole so that I can see the adjuster. And I'm going to give it a couple clicks for now now this side is ready to be bled, and then I'll readjust it once the wheel's put back on. Obviously on the rear of the car, we need to take the wheel and the drum off. I've turned the drum until the adjuster was visible. I'm going to back that off so that it'd be the easiest to take the drum off. And the next parts are done underneath the car, so I'll get it up in the air. On the Mark I and Mark II Sprites, they have a lever on the back of the wheel cylinder and that's for the parking brake. So I'm gonna take this pin out that connects the parking brake to the lever and I'm going to take out this banjo bolt right here which connects the brake pipe and the bleeder to the wheel cylinder. Once I have those two removed, I can also take this boot off the back of the wheel cylinder and then all of this stuff will be disconnected and out of the way for removing the wheel cylinder. Okay, I have the handbrake disconnected, and I also have the banjo bolt that connects to the wheel cylinder disconnected as well. This does take a 5 8 Whitworth wrench to undo, so make sure that you have your Whitworth wrenches handy if you're tackling the rear wheel cylinder job on your Mark I or Mark II Sprite. Next is to pull out the adjuster so that I can make room for removing the wheel cylinder. This job can be done without taking the backing plate or the shoes off but it is a little bit of a trick to get everything lined up so that the wheel cylinder can come out. So there's a slot in the shoe right here and I like to just stick my screwdriver into that and use that to pull the shoe up and out and away. Make sure that it doesn't get caught on the back of the backing plate. Just pull out a little bit if it does and then you should be able to slide the adjuster out giving you quite a bit more room down here. Use that same slot on the other shoe to get that shoe off of the cylinder so that the cylinder can come out and away. Now the trick to removing the cylinder is to pull it up into the slot that retains it and then pulling it back down the other way. I wish I could tell you there's one simple trick to getting this out, uh, doing it this way, which is probably the quickest way to do it. And also make sure that your handbrake lever is free. This can be difficult if the cylinder is seized. And as I've done here, you can use the, the edge of the shoe to kind of hold it up on the backing plate so that you can hold the lower one out of the way to get this maneuvered out of there. When I do the brake job on the next barn sprite, I'll do it a different way show you how to do it that way, but this is definitely the quickest way to replace the wheel cylinders on the Mark I and Mark II Sprite. Here's my new wheel cylinder. You can see as the lever is pulled, that pushes up on the cylinder a little bit, and that is what sets your parking brake. You can also see the slots right here. This is what holds this cylinder to the backing plate. This slot up here is bigger than the one at the bottom, so what is actually going on when you remove the cylinder is you're sliding this up into the backing plate so that the bottom can be kicked out and then you pull it down to remove the top slot from the backing plate and then the whole thing can be removed. Now I'll just slide my adjuster back in. I'm gonna make sure that it's turned to the lowest position. Now I just need to hook everything back up. I've gotten it all back together. Don't forget to put your boot on before you put the parking brake 
and the banjo bolt back on. Now I just need to do the other two sides and then I'm ready to bleed the brakes, see how they work. Let's see if all the brake fluid drained out while I was doing that. So I'm going to get that topped off and then bleed the brakes again. I had the brakes bled and I had the wheels back on the car. And I've used the brakes now, tested them, make sure they work. So that should have centered the shoes. Now I need to adjust them. You want to click your adjuster on until the brakes grab. Okay, they grabbed right there. Now I want to back it off one more click. There's one click. And that's gonna be my setting for where I'm gonna leave the drum brakes. After you drive the car a little bit, it may either bed in the new shoes that you put in or clean up the drums and the original shoes. So you may need to come back and adjust it. And you may have gotten it adjusted too tightly, which will create excess heat. And you wanna come back and release it. So make sure you test drive the car before you finalize your brake setting. And then there is a little dust plug that you can put in through the wheel. And that just plugs that hole up so that you don't get anything into your brake drums. That's it for today with the Mark II Austin Healy Sprite. If you want to see more videos like this, comment below and click subscribe. I'm Steve for This Week With Cars, and last time when you saw this 1962 Austin Healey Sprite, I got the car running and driving, the engine runs, the brakes work, the clutch works, but today I'd like to take a look at making the car a little bit more drivable, going through things like lights and fixing all the little things that'll make it a lot nicer to drive around. In one of the previous videos when I turned the lights on, one of the headlights was not working. The left headlight is all fogged over, so I think it's a headlight and not a wiring issue. So I'm just going to replace both headlights so that they match. The headlights come out of these cars very easily. It's pretty much the same process on all British cars of this vintage. There's a screw down here. Just remove that screw with a flat screwdriver. So there's two clips up here that hold this ring on, so I like to push down a little bit and then pull out on the bottom. You can't pull on the top because it's held in up there and then lift it up a little and it should come out. To get the bulb out, there's three Phillips screws around here. Do not loosen the flat headed ones. Those are for adjusting the angle of the headlight. And then pull the bulb off of the connector and then reverse the process putting it back together. The bulbs have these blocks right here, so you cannot put them in the incorrect direction. All of the other parts are all keyed as well, so that they will only go on one way. The tabs on this are not spaced the same, so they cannot go that way. This ring only goes on one way. On this ring, the rivet always goes at the top. However, there is a little tab right here, and that goes through this little hole right here and keeps this ring being clocked correctly as well. So make sure that you hold it above the two clips that are up here. Those clips are right here. Make sure you hold it back onto those, push down on the top, and then push the bottom in. And it should pop into place. And then replace the screw on the bottom. This holds the ring from popping off. Although they are held very well, even without the screw. Now turn it on and test it. Now if you remember from my first video, the cable to release the bonnet is seized up. So I'm going to have to take this grill out to get to that, to loosen the cable up on this end, and then I can loosen it underneath the dash. To take the grill out, there's four flat-headed screws on the top, and then down on the bottom are two Phillips screws that need to be released to release the bottom of the grill. There are nuts on the bottom side of these bolts, so you'll have to stick your wrench in through the grill so that you can hold the nut while you unscrew these bolts. Just let the nut fall for now. You can retrieve it after the grill is off, and I'll show you how to put these back on 
when you're reinstalling the grill. With the grill moved, now we have access to get to the cable. Just have to undo this cable nut that holds the cable together and then unwind it from the release latch. After that's done, the cable can be pulled into the inner fender through this hole right here that goes in behind where the front wheel is. Once you have your cable pulled through this hole into the inner fender well, you have to remove this clip right here which holds the cable inside here so that you can pull it through this grommet and back into the engine bay. This clip is held in by this nut right here. The bonnet release comes through this grommet right here and there's also a clip in the engine bay right here. Once this clip has been removed, the entire cable can be pulled into the interior of the car. With the bonnet cable pulled completely into the footwell now, it's just one nut on the back there to remove the cable and then reverse the whole process to install the new bonnet cable. Here's what the installation of the new cable looks like. Now I can refit the grill. I'm going to install the two outer bolts first. That way I can leave this spaced out a little bit and get my finger in underneath here in the grill. To get the nuts underneath here, I'm going to put a little bit of grease on my finger. I don't need that much. And I'll get that on the washer and on the nut. That way they stick to my finger more and I can stick my finger in there and then get the bolt started. And I'll continue that process for the next three. Now to install the screws that go way down in here, I'm going to stick a strong magnet onto my screwdriver, which will magnetize it and allow me to hold the screw this way to get it started down in the hole there. Okay, I got it started. Now I can position the grill in the final placement of where I want it and tighten it down. Let's test it one more time. I was just cleaning out the car and discovered some very neat things. If you have a car that's extremely original like this car, it'll still have these factory marks. Now this is writing that was put on when the car was produced. This is saying that this body is a Sprite it has a black interior. There's a number right here on um, bug eyes. This would actually be part of the VIN number. I'm not sure what the number on this one signifies because this car on the back of the dashboard has all of its factory writing there as well, signifying how the dash should be laid out with mile per hour gauges. And it also lists the last four digits of the VIN number of this car, 4909, just as it does on the back of the dash on Mark I sprites. The next thing I want to look at is the charging system because I'm not going to get very far on just the charge of the battery. So let's start up the car. You can see the ignition light is on right now. I don't have the engine running, but if the generator is working, this light will go off. So you can see the light is still on. So that means the generator is not charging the battery at this point. So let's get under the bonnet and take a look at that. When a car has been sitting for as long as this one, it's not uncommon that the generator has become depolarized. The generator needs to be polarized in order to work because it needs to know if you have a positive ground or a negative ground car. Before you go around checking anything else, it's a good idea to polarize the generator and see if that's what the issue is. Here on the regulator box, you can see the first two terminals are A and the third terminal is F. So I want to just take my screwdriver and connect A and F together, and that will polarize the generator. So I'm just touching this little bar right here on A, and then if I push my screwdriver forward, it'll hit the terminal of F, producing the little spark and polarizing the generator. Do you see that little spark there? Do it a couple times for good measure. Okay, now the generator is polarized. I'll start the car again 
and see if it started producing power. You can see the ignition light is still on, so the problem was not that the generator needed polarized. We have a bigger issue with the charging system. So the next thing I want to do is check to see if the generator is any good and can make power on its own. So I'm going to pull off the wire off of the F terminal. So we're looking at our little code here. And I also want to take this wire off of the D terminal. And then I'm going to start the engine and touch them together. Now you only want to touch them together momentarily and watch for a spark. If there is a spark, we know that the generator is producing power. If there's not, then I need to take the generator off and rebuild it. Okay, now I'll touch the two wires together and we'll see if it sparks. It should be sparking like crazy right there, so the generator is not producing any power. Oh, there it goes. Okay, as you can see, we have our sparks. The generator is making power. Now that we saw the generator producing power, I'm going to polarize it one more time and just double check and see, and see if it is working now. So I'll go between the A terminal and the F terminal and short that out with my screwdriver. It produces a little bit of spark doing that. Still the ignition light is on, so we must have a problem with the regulator. Now that we think the problem lies in the regulator, I'm going to pop the cap off of it. And I don't hear people talk about these a lot, but there's actually two sets of points inside the regulator, just as there's points in your ignition system. And these points corrode just like it does in your ignition system, and then your charging system will not work properly. So I'm going to go grab my points file. But before you do any filing or sanding on these points, make sure that you disconnect the battery. Otherwise, sparks are going to be flying everywhere. So make sure you disconnect your ground before proceeding any further. This is my contacts file. This is the same one that I use for ignition points. There's one set of points right here that you can easily get your points file into. And then another set of points right here, which I'll have to back off this adjustment screw in order to get enough room to get my points file in there and get both sides of the points right here uh, cleaned up. I'm going to insert my file right here. Just put a little bit of pressure on that so that it cleans up both sides of the points. Trying to keep it straight so that I don't file it to an angle. Okay, that should be good. Now I'll grab a screwdriver so that I can loosen this adjustment and clean the points right here. Now I have enough room to get my file into these points here. It is naturally spring-loaded, so if you push this down, let it up on your file, then you can just move it up and down, get that surface cleaned up. Now when screwing this adjuster back in, you need to make sure that the point gap is set correctly. And you actually want the point gap to be when this is held down. So you want to hold that down and then put your feeler gauge in there make sure that your point gap is set correctly. You want it to be about 15 thousandths. So just give it a few adjustments until you think you have it right. Now let's start the car again and see if the regulator is working. Now that we have the regulator cleaned and adjusted, let's try it again. You can see the ignition light went off this time. So the generator is charging. Let's hook up a voltmeter and double check. Okay, I have a voltmeter connected. You can see the battery right now is charging up. It's at about 12.7 volts, and if I speed the engine up, that should increase. As the amount of charging available increases as engine speed increases. So we should see the battery start to charge the more that we let it run. When a car has been sitting as long as this one has, it's a good idea to put a new radiator cap on. It's also a good idea to replace all of your radiator hoses. Now, I'm not sure if this radiator leaks. It has shows evidence here that it does leak, all this green stuff that you see around. So I'm going to dump water in the radiator 
and we'll see if it starts leaking because I don't want to replace the hoses yet until we know if the radiator is any good because if I have to pull it out anyways and we haven't found out that the radiator was bad, we just did a bunch of work that we have to do again. In an unknown car, you always want to put water in it first. That way you're not wasting a whole bunch of antifreeze. Okay, I am starting to hear it leak from somewhere. There's water pouring out of the bottom of the car. It's leaking out of the bypass hose. This is next to the water pump. It looks like it's been replaced recently, but it also looks like it's split. So someone's been in there and replaced it, but they didn't do a very good job putting it in. I'm going to top the radiator off just to see if there's any other leaks that show up. Well, I filled the radiator up and I don't see any other leaks. That doesn't mean that this radiator isn't going to leak once it's heated up and at a pressure. But right now there is no water leaking out of it, so that's a good sign. Well, I think that's it for today for this 1962 Austin Healy Sprite. Next time I need to address the entire cooling system. And if you want to see more videos like this, comment below and click subscribe. I'm Steve from This Week With Cars and it's time to get back to the 1962 Austin Healey Sprite. I had to get a head start on this video so I've already pulled the radiator, taken it to a radiator shop and gotten it checked and rebuilt. To get the radiator out, first I had to remove the grill again. Remove the upper and lower hoses going to the radiator. and remove the bolts securing the radiator to the car. Although the grill does not have to come out to remove the radiator, it's much easier by removing the grill as the upper two bolts have grommets that allow you to remove them and have easy access to the upper bolts. So if you remember from the previous video, the whole reason I'm digging into this is because this hose right here is leaking. When I filled the engine and radiator full of water, it just started pouring out right here. This accordion looking hose fails quite often and I know it upsets a lot of people. A lot of people put a straight hose in right here. And I did a lot of thinking of which type of hose I should put in here. Should I put one of these in like it's supposed to be or should I just take a piece of straight hose stick it in there and call it done. Well, I've decided that I'm going to do it right and I have a new accordion hose here with two new hose clamps. This is by far the easiest to install, especially if you're not going to remove the head. If you have the head off and you put this hose on when you bolt the head down, it makes it really easy to get the hose in there and putting a straight hose in at that point might make a lot of sense. But for the purposes of this video, I'm going to do it right, and I'm going to replace it with another hose like this one. Before I remove this one, I'm going to get this lower radiator hose out of the way. This little hose that comes off the top of it, that goes to the heater core. And by the way, on these cars, these wire clamps are the original style. These style clamps would not have been seen on these cars. These weren't invented yet. And this is what the original clamp should look like. Before you go installing your new hose, this little fitting right here that comes down from the bottom of the head, that can be corroded away. I've seen these rust out and sometimes there's very little of this fitting left. This is a replaceable part, but before you stick your hose in, make sure that both of these fittings here are in good shape and not completely corroded. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how good your hose is, it's probably going to leak. These two look in great shape, so I'm just going to put a new hose on. It might be easiest to fit this with only one hose clamp on it in the beginning. Just slip that on. I prefer to slip it on the bottom. Now I can grab my other hose clamp, and it wasn't in the way. Just slide the upper hose clamp on. And then you'll need something like a screwdriver to compress the hose to get it slid on. I prefer to just put it across the top like that. Then you can just bring it up underneath the fitting and let go of it. 
Now I want to make sure that I have it centered up and down. So I may need to raise it up onto the upper fitting a little bit. And then when you have it where you want it, just clamp it down. I think a lot of damage to the hoses happen to these when people are putting the hose clamps on them. They don't have them quite over the fitting and then they end up clamping above or below the fittings and cutting the hose. And now it's just refitting the upper and lower radiator hoses and reinstalling the radiator. The scariest part of this job was removing this. This is the sender for the water temperature gauge. As you can see, it's very rusty. And this pipe no longer turns in the nut. These two pieces should turn independently, but they are frozen together. So I'm going to put some penetrating oil on this and see if I can get this loosened up to make it easier to install safely. Don't ever take a torch and try to apply heat to one of these because this will explode and the gas inside of this is also explosive and it'll make a nice little bang for you. I'm just going to wiggle the two back and forth quite a bit, see if it will eventually loosen enough that I can start rotating it all the way around. Okay, I've made it all the way around now. Now I'll be able to spin this nut in while leaving this pipe to be stationary. I don't want to be twisting this pipe as I'm trying to screw this nut in. Now I can bolt the radiator in and connect the lower radiator hose to the radiator. The lower radiator hose is real fun on these cars because there's no good way to get to it. It takes some force to be able to push the hose onto the nipple, but in this position, there's not a real good way to do it. You just have to kind of get your hand up in there and pry on it from anywhere that you can. You can grab the hose with your left hand and then wiggle the radiator to squeeze it on there. Another trick you can do if you're having a problem is to put some grease on the inside of the hose. That will make it slip onto the nipple easier. You can grab the hose with your left hand and then wiggle the radiator to squeeze it on there. Another trick you can do if you're having a problem is to put some grease on the inside of the hose. That will make it slip onto the nipple easier. Getting everything lined up to get the radiator back in could be fun. Having an electric driver like this can be really helpful. That way you can hold things with your hands and still spin it. Now before I tighten that completely, I'll get all the others started. Leave it a little bit loose so that it can move around a little bit before I tighten them all down. Don't forget to put your plastic plugs back in. You might be able to get these in from the back side if the grill was still on, but it's sure a lot easier doing it this way. Okay, now the moment of truth. I need to fill the radiator up, see if it leaks. I'm only going to put in water right now because I need to see if Anywhere else is going to leak. I don't know if the heater core is going to start leaking now that we can finally get that filled up with water. So I'm just going to put in water for now. All right, we're full of water. You can see the level there. And so far, I don't see anything leaking. This is just water that I dripped coming out right there. Next step will be to start the engine. That way we can run the water pump, make sure that we get all the air out of the system and see if anything leaks. Don't see any signs of leaking down by the heater cord. I'm gonna squeeze the upper radiator hose, get some 
see if there's any air in there. Now let it run for a bit, let it warm up. I am curious if the temp gauge is going to work, if this is still okay over here. I'm letting the car run so that I can warm it up and check for leaks. There is a drip coming from right here, and that's because I filled the radiator up and the water in there is expanding out and it's coming out of the overflow tube, which it drains down right down to the ground. I'm going to put the cap on now so that it can build up some pressure and really test the coolant system. Gauge is starting to go up now, so the pipe from the radiator to the water temperature gauge might still be good. And I haven't seen it leaking any more water. So I think we can call this job done. Well, that's it for today for the Barn Fine 1962 Austin Healey Sprite. All the things needed to make this car drivable are done now. Now we can concentrate on the smaller and more time consuming things of making sure that everything works and making sure that it's an enjoyable driving experience. So if you want to see more videos like this, comment below and click subscribe. I'm Steve for This Week With Cars and I'm almost done with this 1962 Austin Healey Sprite. The car now runs and drives, but it could drive better. So today I'm going to take the twin SUHS2 carbs off, clean them up and install rebuild kits in them, put them back in the car and show you how to tune them. First, we need to get them out of the car. I did not put the air cleaners back on the car because I knew I would have to at least adjust the carburetor so I didn't want them on. So the air cleaners are already off and removing the carbs is actually pretty simple. You just need to remove the choke cable, the throttle cable, the vacuum line back here, and the fuel hose. And then other than that, there's just two bolts behind each of the carburetors. You undo those and you can take the set out. I just leave the linkages in place and take both carburetors out as one piece. These are very easy carbs to rebuild. The only thing you need to watch for is keeping some of the parts to the carb that you've taken them off of. Don't mix the parts in between the two, especially the pistons and the dash pot covers. You wanna keep those with the original carb body that you took them off of. If you end up having problems with a piston hanging up and not returning properly, you may need to switch your pistons or your dash pot covers because maybe a previous owner has mixed them up in the past. I have had carbs before where I couldn't get the piston to return properly and I've tried three or four dash pot covers before I could get the carburetor to work properly. I'll take the linkages out between the two carbs. This is a little trick that I use to keep everything together. I'll take my cover off, I'll set it with the carb body, take my spring out, and the piston has a needle on the bottom of it. To keep these straight because these don't sit well on a bench, I've taken just a plastic cup, cut a hole in the top, and now that will set. And I have labeled the cups front and rear so I can keep track of all the parts for the front carb and all the parts for the rear carb. When you're taking the top off of your float bowl, be careful with this little tag. This identifies exactly what carburetor this is, and you want to return these if you can. Let's see how bad it looks in here. That is really stuck on. This has not been off in a long time. There we go. Always feel your float. Sometimes these fill up with gasoline and they end up getting a little heavier than they should be. And of course they won't work right if they're not as buoyant as they should be. So far it looks pretty good in there. Looks like that will clean out really well. You will find that Whitworth fasteners are used on things such as carburetors well past when they're used on anywhere else on the rest of the car. In this case, these carbs use a 3 8 Whitworth nut right here that holds the jet in. 
and the other side of it is a 3 16 Whitworth. The bolt that holds on the fuel bowl is also 3 16 Whitworth. One of the most important things to check when you're going to do a rebuild of one of these carbs is wiggle your throttle shaft and see if there's any play in that. If there's play in there, you're going to have a vacuum leak seeping past the shaft and the body housing. If you have a lot of play in there, you will have to put bushings in here and get a special reamer so that you can put a new throttle shaft in. This one seems just fine. Now that I have the carb apart, I'm going to put it in my ultrasonic cleaner to clean up all of these pieces. The water will get inside all of the little passages that might be left on this carb and it will start cleaning it up from the inside out. And this should come out perfectly clean. The only part of the carb you cannot put in the ultrasonic is the float because it, because it will heat it up and may cause it to explode. So take your float out if you're gonna put your carb into an ultrasonic cleaner. Everything else can pretty much be thrown in there. All of the parts of the front carb are loaded, ready to go into the ultrasonic cleaner. Just turn it on. Now put the top on it, leave it for an hour or more before I come back and check to see how it's going. Now they're all done and all the grime has been cleaned off. Here are the parts straight out of the ultrasonic cleaner. You can see that they are cleaned up a lot compared to what they were before. It's a drastic difference there. Just make sure that when you take your carb body or any parts that have any little holes in it that you take an air gun and you blow all of them out after you remove it from an ultrasonic cleaner. Now I'll just grab the rebuild kit and put it back together. Here's the front carb all put together. Now the kit that I'm using, this is called the Master Kit. This is from Moss Motors. And it includes everything that you need with the exception of a new float and a new needle. The kit even comes with a new throttle shaft and bushings. But in my case, for these carbs, I will not be using these. The one part that I did have a little bit of an issue with, with this kit, is this little rubber washer right here. Now this seal goes in right here on the bolt that holds the float bowl on. And right out of the bag, I couldn't get this washer to go onto that bolt. So I went and I grabbed a cup of boiling water and I put the washer in, in there. And that softened up the washer enough that I could get it onto the bolt for the float bowl. Other than that, it was pretty straightforward. Just put everything back where you took it off. The carbs are installed back in the car, but I need to change a few settings before I try to fire it up. I need to put oil in the dash pots. So I have my SU dash pot oil. Now I've seen people just try to dump that down in there, but if you just lift the piston up, then it's right here at the top and it's easy to get to. Now I'm gonna take my SU adjusting wrench. I'm going to turn the jet down here and I'm going to bring it up until the top of the jet is level with the bridge so i'm going to look inside of here and when that jet comes up and i see it level with the bridge i'm going to stop you could take your dash pot cover and take your piston out that makes it a lot easier to see it or you can grab a light and look in there and see where you're at okay i have the jet on this carb set all the way up to the bridge so now i'm going to adjust the jet two full turns down then go ahead and repeat the process on the other carb. Now I'm going to loosen the linkages between the carbs so that I can change the settings on the carbs individually. I don't want this carb to be affecting that carb and it can do that if the linkages are connected together. So now you can see I can turn these and they don't affect one of the other carbs. They're completely loose from the linkage. The car needs to be running in order to dial the carbs in. And it's harder to get it running like this because you can't pull on the choke and you can't give it throttle. You could always get the car running and then disconnect these and make your adjustments. But I like to have them already loose. All right, it's starting. Over this car, 
the engine wants to die. If I put it over this one, it doesn't affect the engine a whole lot at all. So we know right now the engine is mostly running on this part. So if we take the sink tool, we hold it up to this part, we can see it's about 11. We hold it up to this one, it's about four. So that verifies that we are running on mostly the rear carburetor right now. Front carb right now is just above seven. The rear one is about nine. So I need to turn that one down still. There is an adjustment right here that takes up the slack for when the choke is going to activate the throttle. And sometimes you need to back this screw out in order to get the throttle down enough to where you need it. Check it again. Seven. Still a little more than seven. So on the side of the carb, it's a little lifting pin that lifts the piston up and down. You can use that to determine how your carbs are tuned. So let's push it up. So the speed increased, and then the throttle came back down. So that one is set pretty much where we want to be. Let's test the other one. Again, the engine speed increased, and then it came back down. So that one seems fine now. Now I'm going to set the linkages back to where they need to be. And to do that, I'm going to turn the car off first. There's a bunch of slack that's going to be in the throttle linkage right here. You need to make sure that the slack is in the same position on both of the carbs. Otherwise, when you pull the throttle, it's going to start opening one before the other. So in this case of the throttles, I like to push up on it while I tighten it down so that I know that all of the slack is taken out. And be sure to do that on both sides. This is less important for the choke although you need to make certain that they're both in the same position. Next step is to take it for a drive. Don't put your air cleaners back on now because you're probably not done fine tuning it. Just because the carburetor says things might be working right and the car starts and runs, it may not actually be great on the road. And since the whole point of driving the car is to have a great experience on the road, you may need to adjust things a little leaner or richer than you would have expected to make the car drive well. Every car is going to be a little bit different. So I'll fire it up, take it for a little drive, make some adjustments if I need to. I'll take the little SU wrench and a screwdriver and I can make all the adjustments while I'm out on the road. And by the time I get back to the shop, the car should be tuned the way I want it. Test drive went great. I like how everything is running, so now I can put the air cleaners back on. And there we go. I am finally done under the bonnet of the Sprite. This has been a really fun project. Hey Cassie, what are you doing? I am cleaning chrome. Do you like cleaning chrome? Actually, yes. <laughs> it's probably one of my favorite things. I have just two last items for the car, and that is a new shift knob and a shift boot. I think this will bring everything together. There we go. That's better. What a huge transformation this car has gone through. When you first saw this car, this car hadn't run since 1980. And now look at it. 
If you remember when you first saw it, it only had one seat, didn't have any carpet in it. It was just a total mess. I've been working on this car for a while now, so I can't quite remember what I think it was missing one of the taillights as well. Well, that's it for now for the 1962 Austin Healey Sprite. I really enjoyed doing this project. And if you enjoyed watching it, please comment below and click subscribe. As you can see, now we have some snow on the ground, but I thought I'd take the car for a little winter drive. These cars are great in the winter. The heaters work really well in them. You just want to be careful of the back window, make sure that it doesn't get too cold or ripped or torn. Even without side curtains, I think I should be all right. The temperature today is only 30 degrees Fahrenheit, and the temperature on the car has not come up yet. It may take a very long time at uh, how cold it is outside. I have bundled up with a coat, and as long as I rest my arm here on the window, which doesn't seem to be too cold, it does block enough air from coming in the window and making me too cold. On the sprites and digits, there are little vents down in the foot wells that just dump a lot of heat down on your feet. I do have it open on the driver's side, and luckily you can't you can close the passenger side, so I have all of that heat that will be coming out and going straight on to me. That's it for the 1962 Austin Healey Sprite. If you want to see more videos like this, comment below and click subscribe.